Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to have Christine Murphy Peck with us today. Christine is the CEO of the IAAP, which is the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which is a bit of a mouthful and uh, one heck of an acronym if you're dyslexic. So, um, welcome, Christine. I'm really pleased to have you here. So, can you tell us a little bit about the IAAP and, and, and what it does? Sure. Uh, as you said, the IAAP is uh, just, a, just over a year old now. We are an organization designed to bring accessibility professionals together. So having done some research with the Department of Labor, realizing that people were defining themselves as accessibility professionals, they uh, sought uh, you know, professional development opportunities, a chance to connect with one another, and that best our research showed us there was not one place where everybody could gather. And this is accessibility professionals in all areas. So we are starting, as you know, in the IT space. That was where we uh, ventured in, and that's one of our major focus areas. Uh, we also know there are accessibility professionals working in law and policy, working in HR. Anyone who has any kind of touch in making their products, their services, their places, their workspaces, their policies accessible, um, we're, you know, we're here for them. And uh, so that, that's one of the things that we do is we want to be the gathering place, sort of the big tent, um, and get a place where people can talk to each other. I'm having this problem. Are you having that problem? I'm having this solution. I, I talked to this wonderful woman in, in the government, and I'm trying to remember which um, division she was from. I met her at an industry event, all of a sudden charged with making a 2,000-page website accessible. And she was beside herself. And I, who wouldn't be, you know, as people are starting to get this to be part of their profession, part of their responsibilities, and then they find that there are other people out there. Oh, they call themselves this, and this is what they do, and there's help for me here. And uh, so she subsequently joined, and I'm thrilled because she can talk to people who are doing this kind of work all day, every day. So bringing people together would be the, the next big thing. Um, obviously providing uh, resources for organizations. So if you need to train somebody, if you've got someone that you want to hire, they're new to it, you want to uh, share with them what it's all about, what they need to know and do, and of course that gets into our certification process, which we can talk more about later. Um, and of course uh, the educational professional development we're running, including our upcoming uh, IAAP Access inaugural event. Um, shameless uh, promo there. Uh, in any case, um, and then the, the last thing is sort of how else can we help organizations? Can we help them to find accessibility professionals? Uh, can we offer them a spot to both seek and um, advertise for jobs? Uh, seek people, also advertise for their own positions. Um, you know, working on some policies and procedures that's yet to come, but how can we be a resource for them uh, as they really seek? You know, companies want to do good work and they, they want to, you know, be good people and they want to do the right thing and they, they just need some help to figure out what all this really means and how can they make it work in their systems. Excellent, thank you. That's a lot of things, but then accessibility touches so many different points within every organization. Uh, there's no bit of the organization that should remain untouched by the time we've finished with them, right? That's uh, right. Uh, so it's not just about IT. It's, it's about that, the way that the organizing, organization addresses inclusiveness, which I think was a topic for last week as well. We, we need to be thinking about how to be inclusive as, as organizations and how to go about that, how to raise the standard. Because one of my real bugbears as a recruiter of people, because I'm growing my team and, and our organization recognizes we need to do the work, is actually finding people with the right skills, is finding how we can recruit them. And you know what, saying that I'm an accessibility professional with 15 years experience doesn't cut it because it could be 15 years experience of doing the wrong thing. So we, we absolutely need to find some way of standardizing what it is that we say we do, how we organize ourselves, how we educate ourselves. And I think it's really important to have that kind of certification. And from a UK point of view, I know we've had some of your your contributors on already. We've had uh, Nigel Lewis on from AbilityNet, and so Nigel and I 
are working on stuff within the UK. Um, but but it is it is really important. Uh, something that we're already doing within our own organisation. We've set up. Um, oh yes, we've had Mike Pacquiello as well. So um, you know, some 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 luminaries from the from the accessibility industry already. But we're trying to educate young people because I'm I'm not young. The, the, most of the people that I interview are not young. Um, where's the next generation coming from? If we don't create a professional framework, then at some point we're all going to retire and there's no, no one going to be left to look after us in our dotage. So we need to selfishly train people up. So that's one of the reasons why we've set up an apprentice program. Uh, within within our organisation to teach accessibility apprentices, but but equally, I recognise that that's only one stage. That's only IT, and we need a, a recognised professional framework. So, um, I know Deborah, you've got a question. Yes, I, um, Christine, thank you for joining us. It really is an honour for us to have you on here, and I was um, a very big supporter right away. I wrote a blog about why we should do it, and um, and the thing that I really appreciate that IAAP has done is that we're really focused on that I. It's not just about the United States, even though we got a lot of fires burning in the U.S. about this stuff, but it is, it's a global, and so I appreciate that leadership that, that we have pulling everybody in together and in the United States as we all know you know a lot of companies are getting sued over this I mean there are estimates that we're seeing about 20 lawsuits that are just getting settled quietly um, every single week and so I think you know there's a real danger in the United States in that like Neil was saying people say they're they're qualified accessibility experts and what does that mean it becomes a real buyer beware and and also oh, we try traditionally have not been very welcoming to younger people training to join and so there's such an important leadership role for IAAP to um, to have here and and I know that one of the things I have a question for you and this is a tough question Christine that as an industry as an industry I think we've got to deal with but I know as you know y'all pull together a lot of really important and people from all over the world you've got uh, groups going you're having your inaugural event um, but the reality is still to really put together platforms and you know chats and everything that's fully accessible so every one of our members can participate has been really um, tough and I don't know if you want to address that a little bit or not but it, it's I know it's been tough for IAAP because the world's not accessible yet right no it, it's it's that's an excellent point Deborah is um, it, you know as we find with everything that we purchase everything we touch everything and the certification is a perfect example so we're you know we're really making headway in terms of how are we going to design an exam process that is accessible globally uh, you know allowing people who are differently able to take the exam and you know we're we're really pushing at that industry and and there, you know, we found some great partners to move forward with us. But as you said, everywhere we go to purchase a platform, whether it's a, a membership database, whether it is an online communication system, whether it's a registration system, every area needs to be reviewed and touched, even the physical space for our meeting. So we do an accessibility audit of the location. And that set of steps, as you said, it, you know, it, it's necessary, it's got to be done. As Neil was saying, I think ideally one day we get to the point where that's part of the planning at the get-go um, and so we're not doing it after the fact, um, but we're working with a lot of organizations to help them, you know, if they want to do business with us, to help them find the way. Um, and uh, as you said, the road isn't easy, in part because the level of accessibility is defined by whom um, and, uh, you know, and, and in what measures. So that's that is part of our challenge and uh, so any system we buy before we opened up our database and our connections newsletter and those uh, about 300 uh, hours of accessibility testing alone. So. Yeah, yeah. 
Yep. It, it's really intensive, and and I don't think a lot of um, people realize the intensity um, that you're doing, and so you're taking a real leadership role. And uh, I also want to make sure that um, those of us that can't attend the inaugural event, unfortunately, I'm one of those that can attend because of a speaking engagement. But you were saying earlier on before we started filming, there were other ways that people could join. And so I was wondering if you would address that. And then I'm going to turn it back to Neil because he has a comment to make about one of our former guests. Super. Um, we are recording all the sessions so that people can um, access them after the fact. We are, and of course, they'll, they'll have uh, all of the appropriate um, accessibility, uh, you know, we'll make it accessible for anyone who wants to tune in afterwards, as we do with all of our webinars. Um, so both the closed captioning and, and the uh, video captioning. And we are doing a virtual event, and we're opening that registration up later this week. So if you can't be with us, you know, in person, you can be with us from the comfort of your own home or in your office if you've got office mates. Um, and you know, we, we understand the realities of, of travel, both coming globally, we're a global organization, um, and also for, for folks in the government for whom travel uh, is limited, and uh, but they can uh, apply for training dollars. And we wanna make sure that our very event is accessible in many formats for people, whether they can be there as indicated in person or wanna join us um, online or after the fact and, and listen in and then continue the chat on connections or other methods, you know, to sort of keep the learning and keep the activity and keep the community going. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, you were mentioning exams. One of our previous guests, a lady called Abby James, is, is actually doing work with the British Dyslexia Association and, and the number of exam boards in the UK around accessible exams. So if you're interested, I'm more than happy to connect you. I would love that. Thank you, Neil. I really would. We're, we're fortunate to have many experts helping us design the exam who are teaching accessibility uh, and doing a very good job of it. So they have, you know, so they're going through this process with that nature. But as we start to actually prepare the exam, we're, we welcome that sort of help and information. Thank you. So, I, oh, Antonio, you have a question? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, th thank you for for you no know, for the for the opportunity to you know to be uh, with the Access Trust community and to have this talk with us. Um, something that I you know that uh, we see so many buzzwords today. You know, Internet of Things, uh, shared economy. Uh, does uh, you know startups are you know challenging uh, a lot of business models around the world from the financial system to uh, hotels or, or transportation like Uber or, or Airbnb. So what I would like to know from you is what type of engagement is the association having with, with, with startups and with these new, uh, uh, let's say, uh, challengers of the current business models? Well, that's a very good question. So you mean in terms of connecting with them or in terms of ensuring that they have provided the appropriate resources? In, in bo in both. So at, as you can imagine, the, the challenge for us is, is starting out and figuring out where to focus our need, and the need is so great. And so I must be, you know, open about the fact that we have not connected purposefully yet with organizations like that, with startups to help them, you know, integrate all of the accessibility needs into their process. Now, as we focus on organizational development and resources, what we'd love is for IAAP to have basically a toolkit or a series of resources that organizations can come to us and obtain. So if I'm Airbnb and I want to know how to, you know, fix this problem, make my sites accessible, what do I need to share with people who are renting their homes to people from other places to make the place accessible? You know, for us that would be that would be the dream. And we're, you know, we hope to get there. Um, what we're so we're we're starting now to make relationships with the folks that we know are interested and in the stream. So people who have expressed themselves as our member companies and they want to be with us. Um, you know, the, the venture into sort of the next realm of startups and where they need and 
would most likely welcome assistance, especially given that they're new, Airbnb, I think since 2008, so a young company. Um, I, I must tell you that I, that's, you know, certainly something that we'd like to, to get to in the future. Um, my hope is that as we start to become more known and do more work, they'll start to come to us and say, hey, here's a place where we can go and we can find not only experts, we can find people who've been through the certification program, we can find people to help us, um, and then we'll have some additional, as indicated, some organizational resources they can use. Did you think of this? Did you know this? What we we did for the hotel is we basically, after we, we did the audit, we gave them a punch list like you would do in a construction project. And they got the punch list and they said, oh, this is what that means? Yeah, the hardware goes here, not there. The door opens this way, not that way. You need to, all you need to do is fix the tension on this door so somebody in a chair can move through it. And when they can see that it's that, so these, are, these are fixes that are, you know, you put that pretty thing in front of the sink or in front of the commode because it looks, you know, lovely or whatever it is, but it's absolutely useless. To someone in a chair and they're just they like I said they're not thinking about they don't they're not trying to make it an inaccessible experience um, so I think to your point Antonio translating what seems very vague and very scary and making it really very nuts and bolts if you want to have an accessible website here's some of the great steps if you want to know how to make your place accessible here's what you need to be thinking about and just making it very common very if you will, accessible, very understandable so people can integrate it into what they're doing. Oh, I just have to move this piece of hardware? Yes, just move this piece of hardware. And now it's not all that simple. I don't mean to say that it was that simple, but I was astounded how when we just gave them this simple list, like you would do on a construction project, they could take it, read it, and understand it. And they could implement it, more importantly, and quickly. You know, this isn't a $25,000 fix. This is a few hours of labor to make it a much easier place for our folks to get around and to enjoy themselves. Uh, another interesting uh, uh, area that uh, myself and Neil we end up with this uh, Twitter conversations with some people uh, um, from from some of, from some startups that we were talking also about diversity. And if you if Neil if you remember, uh, sometimes they oh let's do a. a Let's talk about diversity and how we deal with diversity. And they all they tend to look at diversity from a gender perspective, and they don't really understand that diversity is also about including people with different needs uh, and including uh, you know, accessibility in in, the, in their own vocabulary. So there's a, uh, some uh, there's I think that it's important also do to evangelize them into change their their way of thinking and to to look this in a more broader perspective right no i'm i'm with you there and i love the the chats i've been seeing and the tweets i've been seeing on your feed lately about that very subject um it really is about everybody and as neil you joked about all of us in our dotage but look we're you know we're going to need help reading those websites and we're all living longer and we're all on this planet longer and um, you know, so the need will just grow. And uh, but I, I love your point, Antonio. It really diversity is the broad spectrum. Neil, you're muted. As Antonio says, people consider it just to be a gender issue, which is not. You you've, you've got all the cultural issues. You've got um, absolutely uh, diversity covers disability. It covers. All, all of the the wide variety of things, rather, just to concentrate on gender is not diverse. You know, you, you're actually dealing with the the largest. You know, and, and when we're talking about gender, people think just for women as well, and actually it shouldn't be. It's about equality of opportunity for everyone. So um, I'm quite happy to engage with people on those conversations and to help, but. When you were talking, Christine, and we were talking about the startups, you know, I was thinking whether or not your title should be Chief Ocean Boiler, because actually you've really got a tough job to, to actually come out and, and change how every com company is, is, is going to address this stuff. So, so 
you do have to start somewhere, and, and I agree. You start with the the coalition of the willing, and and, and those are your your core members, etc. So um, I, I understand why you haven't gone to every single startup because it's hard because it's woven into everything. So so we have to, we have to decide what it is that we need to to address first, and I think simplification is really important. So can you tell us a little bit more about the the, the, the work you're doing with the certification and then I know that Deborah's got another question as well. Sure. So we are embarking on our, our first certification program and it really is sort of a, a base level of knowledge of accessibility and I, I shared with my subject matter experts I you know again it's been not quite a year for me but I was astounded at their level of knowledge and I don't, I said to them, I said, I, I don't think you guys have any idea just how much you have in this room, just the wealth of knowledge and expertise around this area. And so we're writing the exam, which will be the, the first sort of, if you think of a pyramid, Neil, sort of the bottom of the pyramid, yeah. the lightest base. So it covers, in fact, we, we're just putting this on our website, but it does cover three areas. So disabilities, um, accessibility, and universal design. So back to sort of that, that broader nature of, you know, sort of every aspect of accessibility. And then standards, laws, management strategies, that kind of area. So that's what came out of our uh, work with our subject matter experts in June. We are now launching our, um, what we will do is it's a, a survey that basically is a job analysis survey. And so we test people in the community and we've got about 4,000 people we would say who are in our community on our newsletter list that Deborah edits for us. Um, and um, and just get their sense of how often they perform these tasks, how important they are to them. And from that, we get what we call an exam blueprint. So we're actually at that stage. The survey should launch this week. And from that blueprint basically indicates how much time people spend on each of these areas. Um, and that outlines how much energy you spend on each or how much subject time you give to each of the subject areas or questions. So if it's 30, 20, 40, 40% 40 of the exam would be on this area, 10% on that, 30 on the other. So I don't think that adds up to 100. Let's see here. So 20, 20, 30. No. Anyway, you get the <laughs> sense of the thing. But what we do is then we weight it so we know how many questions we need in each area. And when we get together at IAAP Access, we're actually going to start doing the exam writing. So item writing, as they call it in the certification business. And so we will launch that exam in the um, end of first quarter, early second quarter of 2016. And that will be sort of the base knowledge. We're also simultaneously working on one for um, digital web. Uh, we know there's mobile devices that are important. We know there's a whole segment around law and policy that may become its own area. Um, and again, to your point about the globalization, um, you know, sort of how much is U.S. centric versus how much is, you know, centered around law and policy around the world. And we're, we're sort of sorting that out now based on the exam, um, you know, the survey data that comes back to us. However, you know, we can certainly integrate a whole process of continuing education for people who get certified around what's happening globally. So, you know, we're, we're getting the feedback and once we get it, then we'll put the exam questions together, we'll launch it, and then we'll see how much we have internationally versus U.S. centric. For, you know, we've got people from around the globe writing questions for us. Um, it, it's just a matter of, you know, sort of what the critical mass is in terms of the, the audience that responds to the survey and the people that we're serving right now. Um, but please know that that's not something that we would forget or don't know is important. You know, comparative ways of doing accessibility around the globe are critical. And you'll see on our conference schedule, there's a lot of conversation about how people are doing it, what they're doing, um, given the laws and policies and standards in each of their countries. Um, so that will continue to be an area that we navigate. This exam is not one that will sit for very long. Oftentimes when you do an exam, you know, you do a job analysis again every three years, maybe every five. In some cases, I anticipate this exam will be touched probably every year, um, simply because of the changing nature of the technology, the changing nature of the policies, 
Um, and so it'll move much more quickly and much more fluidly than many exams that, that people have taken in the past. And once we get that one rolled out, we'll start doing sort of what we call the individual competency areas, including, as indicated, the digital web, and start to put that process together. So before, before I, I, I let Deborah loose again, um, <laughs> does that mean that, that it's a certification and that you would have to recertify? Yes. Okay. So on a yearly basis. Okay. Deborah? Well, and um, just dovetailing off that, good, because if I take an exam one time, but I don't, I mean, as we all know, accessibility moves so fast. And even now in the United States, as we're going from our law, Section 508, and refreshing it to WCAG, I, I recently did that for a client, and I thought I knew everything a bit about WCAG, but boy, when you really sit down to translate, really translate it for a major corporation, it's it, there. There's a lot to it, and so, and I'm part of one of the working groups on WCAG, so it's uh, there's a lot to know, and you can't be an expert at everything. You just can't be, and so uh, I think it's just so important in what you're doing, and. The question I have for you, Christine, is, uh, the, once again, I applaud you for being global and having many voices, and I know the founders are, um, they're companies from all over the world. It's not just U.S.-centric. And um, But what can we as a community, what can we really do to get behind IAAP and help? And I would ask you to think about one little thing. I mean, it, are there opportunities like whenever, I work with a lot of universities too, so when they're pursuing grants, is there an opportunity for us to include IAAP in that grant process to help drive funding and some support there for you? But what can individuals, corporations, what can we all do to help IAAP be successful? Because this is our industry. This is our association. So what can we do, Christine? Well, I think, well, I think the is just what you said, just what you said. Just recognize it as our industry and to help us be the voice of that industry. And that means, you know, becoming members, tapping into connections, volunteering when we send the call out, filling out the survey, you know, sharing feedback and information, whether it's positive or whether it's constructive, you know, that's okay too. Um, you know, just help us join us and be a part of the conversation and, and talk about us in your businesses. And when you're going to corporations, you say, you know, I know an organization where if you're looking to get your folks up to speed, I know where you can go. And, you know, here it is and it's reasonable and it's accessible and it's, you know, you know, it's not cost prohibitive. It's, um, and there's a lot there. And we continue to build our repository of both educational and, and other offerings for people. Um, but the, the more and the bigger and the broader the, or sorry, in terms of topic areas, the conversation is, um, the richer it will be. And so really participating, um, because as we move forward, we're going to need help in lots of areas. The certification is just one of them. Um, you know, we're going to do another call for content for the webinars and for IAAP Access 2016, believe it or not, time to start thinking about that already. Um, and, and other areas where we want to grow and develop. So. Um, just just keeping us in your thoughts, keeping us in the conversations that you have. You guys have already done a wonderful job of that, by the way. Thank you. Even before this conversation, I know you've had Nigel here, you've had our, our good colleague and friend Francis West here, and you've got a lot of people who have been talking about this. Um, and just, you know, helping us define define the organization, helping us define the future as we move forward. And it really means participating. Um, you know, being a part of the educational process, being a part of the membership, um, you know, feeding that repository of content knowledge that we have in the connections, which is our online communication uh, vehicle for members, um, you know, and, and there'll be more things, Deborah. There, there really will be. And I, I thank you for asking because it, it seems sort of shamelessly self-promoting for for me to say it. So I appreciate it. But, you know, just and and. You know, as as we broaden that conversation and we do more work around the world, um, we're we're going to need more help. We're going to need more feedback. We're going to need more subject matter experts. Um, every exam we roll out needs at least twenty five to thirty subject matter experts, and you don't have to be a member. You can be a subject matter expert. You can help us build the content. 
um, and uh, you know you can provide feedback like I said when we're doing the survey that's going to the community not just members um, so the better the more engagement we have the better conversation the better quality of the work we're going to be able to offer the better we know what you need and want because that's what we need is to hear from you uh, and you globally you are members you are supporters you are people who wish you need something else we have some of those folks as well and that's okay it, it's all got to be part of the conversation so you know, participate thank you. yes thank, thank you for um, expanding upon that and one thing that I found um, Neil and Antonio had come to me back um, last fall this time as a matter of fact around this time and said you know we really should do a tweet chat on accessibility and disability inclusion and so little did we know what was going to happen so we started in November and it's like I think the market wants these conversations so bad. That's why we were really excited that you agreed to be on because once again, this is our industry. We care about accessibility, disability inclusion, neurodiversity, all of these all of these moving parts. And the only way we're going to really make a difference is if we join IAAP and we join the conversations. And I am um, an individual member and, um, and I know you gave away um, one year free of membership and then we came up and and I was happy to do it because I when I was in the banking industry you know I spent time you know becoming certified as a mortgage banker um, and so it's part of my professional development to do this and so I, I'm very I really do believe in IAAP and I liked when they were so diligent about seeking a CEO that really had a lot of organizational nonprofit association experience we didn't necessarily need somebody that knew everything about accessibility since nobody does um, we needed somebody that could lead us and so it, we're really really proud to have you on Christine thank you very much very much so before we we wind up the call um, because I know I know we're probably coming towards the end I've got a couple of questions around um, a couple of things really it's about duplication of effort because obviously we know that there are limited numbers of, of the really knowledgeable people we're all spread quite thin um, you know Deborah and I are contributing in lots of different forums sure. um, 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 how do we as responsible individuals make sure that we're not duplicating the work that's all, that we're doing with the standard bodies um, and, and other organizations to make sure that, that we're not wasting our efforts because there's so much work to do that, that we've got to be really targeted in, in making sure that, that we, we expend our energies in, in the best, most effective way possible. So, so how can IAAP build upon and work with other organizations such as the W3C, such as the ISO and any and uh, and all of the European standards bodies, such as organisations like the Business Leadership Network and the uh, and the Business Disability Forum in the UK, because all of these organisations are asking for people's time. They're asking for input, um, and and absolutely, sort of, of course, the UNCRPD being another example, because that's something that that is global. So how can how can IAAP bring all of that together and enable us to be more effective? Well, back to your comment about Chief Ocean Boiler, which I really like, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to start using that. It's time to reprint those cards, and I'm going to put that right on there. Yeah, okay. I think for now, Neil, like, and it's an excellent point. I think for now, it's it's what is our lane. And, and our lane is to be a connector, an educator, a resource, a repository of data, a partner. So we are partnering, for example, with teaching accessibility. Uh, we are starting partnerships with other organizations, to your point, um, to, to see where, where are their synergies. If someone's already doing something, is it our work to redo it? Is it our work to find a way to do it together? Is it our work to help broadcast, you know, help Sure. Cross promote what's happening out there in the industry and you know the, the hard part is we're an organization we like to survive you know you need resources money to survive it's so you know all of that which you all understand um, 
at, at the same time, you know, there's there's a wideness and a, and a help for us. It's been my experience. So to your point, Deborah, and I've done this for 30 years, uh, nonprofit uh, support and management, um, is that there's much more to be gained by opening up than cutting off and just making some sensible, real good choices about what those partnerships look like, where some things are mutually beneficial, being very uh, strategic about what we decide is for the good of the industry because we are here in great part for the good of the industry as well. Um, you know, you can do good and do good business, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and that has been my experience. And so finding out what those key initiatives are, where do we need to be partnered up and connected? And because there's so much happening, as you said, it's you could, we could do a lot of things and not do a lot of things well. We could sort out, you know, where are some of the higher priority needs. Um, and some of that we're sorting through. There is a lot of demand, as you said, and there's a lot of need out there. Um, but the biggest thing, you know, when we start in, like with the certification program, is to do the research and development around, is someone else doing this? you know, if they're doing it, do we partner with them? So we find out, okay, so it's not happening. Um, so let's us do it. And then let's find a way to work in other organizations who are either doing certificate programs or doing something else. You know, can they be continuing education providers? So providing a path for people to participate with us, even if they're not the owners of the content and vice versa. Where are we participants if we're not the owners or the originators of the product or program or service? And, you know, that's really got to be my work in the next, you know, year to three years here. That's that's where, you know, once we get everything launched operationally, which as you guys know from founding and working in organizations, there's a lot of that not sexy stuff that goes on, but it's got to be done. Um, and then now that, you know, those pillars are in place, now, you know, now let's start to really fly. Where, where are the other places that we need to be, have a presence? What do we need to be knowledgeable about? Mapping our certification program so it meets the standards. You know, that's not rewriting standards, but ensuring we have a credible certification program. Sure. Um, you know, those kinds of things um, would, would be my response to you about, you know, how we go about figuring out where, where our lane is, where we can make the biggest contribution. Well, so. Thank you. So I believe uh, our half hour is up. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to uh, seeing you on Twitter tomorrow night. It's going to be fast and furious. I hope you've warmed up your fingers. Uh, I'm ready. Thank you once again. My pleasure.